Hello and welcome to the Rookie Hunter Podcast. This show is all about new hunters and their adventures in the backcountry. On each episode, we'll talk about success, failure, and share our stories of hunting, fishing, and backpacking in British Columbia. Each week, we'll bring in guests to share their experiences, and we'll also bring in experts to discuss topical subjects related to the sport. Today on the show, we introduce ourselves, enjoy a couple of cold beers, and share some stories from our first two hunting seasons. We hope the show inspires you to get outside and appreciate you joining us for this conversation. If you'd like to reach us, you can send us an email, therookiehunterpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the very first episode of the Rookie Hunter podcast. My name is Mike Peterson. I'm Kelly Molnar. So uh, Kelly and I got into this this whole hunting thing together, so we thought it was fitting for us to to get together. And we're in between seasons right now, and we've been texting each other back and forth articles and and just super anxious to, to get back into hunting. So we figured the best way to, to fight that off would be to start a podcast and and share some of our experiences. So we're very new to the uh, to the sport of hunting, um, and that's why we call it the Rookie Hunter Podcast because we're we're still very much learning the ropes of all this. And um, we just got our licenses two seasons ago. I guess what are we at? Just a little over a year ago, really, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we kind of missed the whole first season because yeah. it took. Uh, we didn't take the course until September, right? Exactly. Yeah. So what we want to do is kind of share our experiences and, and hopefully inspire young hunters or guys that are in their late twenties or early thirties, like ourselves to get into hunting. Um, but, uh, we're going to give you a bit of our background today and, and share what we've learned from our, our first season and a half of hunting and, and hopefully you get something out of it. So that intro tune is very fitting to, um, mine and Kelly's relationship because we've really connected through music and uh, we've actually grown up in the same town but Kelly wrote that song and we recorded it a couple weeks back knowing that we were going to do a a podcast together so Kelly and I grew up in the same town of Trail BC in the Kootenai region of British Columbia Uh, we were born just a couple days apart very same hospital so we we must have met at at that point somewhere in the hallway or yeah or something like that (laughs) you're drumming a beat yeah (laughs) And uh, Kelly and I, we, we grew up in two different parts of uh, of trail. There's a lot of sort of surrounding areas. And so we didn't really meet until high school um, and didn't really become close friends until we uh, both moved to the Okanagan to go to school. So I came up here to do a audio engineering program and uh, Kelly came up here to university to do something that's much more sophisticated than audio engineering. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I went into business. And uh, yeah, Kelly being a, a guitar player and and me having a band up here, we ended up uh, just connecting and jam one night and, and ended up uh, being in a band together for multiple years. And that band sort of fizzled out and uh, everybody went their separate ways, but Kelly and I remained in Kelowna and uh, became very close friends over the years here and uh, decided to get into hunting together. So it's been a pretty cool um, adventure over the last year and a half or so. And uh, yeah, so let's get into sort of your background a little bit, Kel, and how you grew up and what sort of brought you into to hunting over the years. Right. Um, yeah, growing up in the Kootenays, lots of outdoor activities there. Uh, I think that's why people live there for the most part. Um, you got lots of skiing, golfing, uh, Columbia River. Um, I mean, most of the people there do hunt. Um, my family, uh, my my dad didn't hunt. His dad did. My father-in-law is a huge hunter. Um, a lot of my uncles hunt. Um, so from my side, I think I kind of... Um, because I didn't have my, uh, the, the kind of father son hunting type relationship. I mean, we did a lot of the other stuff like, uh, mountain biking, skiing, um, all that kind of stuff. So 
we were in the outdoors. Um, appreciation for the outdoors um, was always key. Um, it's just the, the connection to hunting didn't really happen for me until um, we kind of started discussing it. And uh, I guess we can get further into that. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, l- like you said, living in the Kootenays, I think that's exactly what you said is people live there for that that type of lifestyle. And um, if you live in the Kootenays and you aren't outside, then I don't know what the fuck you're doing there, really. Mm-hmm. But it's just mountains and lakes and rivers, and it's absolutely stunning. And I would definitely encourage people to visit the Kootenays if you've never been there before because it's, like, it's absolutely beautiful. But um, th- our upbringings are pretty similar except... Uh, for the fact that my dad was a very avid fisher and hunterman and um, hunterman, hunter, <laughs> fisherman and hunter. Yeah. And uh, we grew up right on the Columbia River, which is a, a large river and uh, great opportunities for fishing rainbow trout. So we had a, an aluminum boat that uh, we would fish in and he had me operating that boat when I was about five years old. So I have a pretty strong connection to, to fishing the river. And I guess that would be my first introduction to hunting, really. They sort of go hand-in-hand, fishing and hunting. Mm -hmm. Um, But we also had a a family cabin in the Caribou region, which is a great area for hunting. And um, that's where I was really introduced to firearms. He bought me a twenty-two. I think it was for my 10th birthday or something like that. And um, my cousin and I, we would go up to the the cabin in the summertime. We'd create these sort of collages from these magazines. So it would be like you know, images of like O.J. Simpson and all this shit <laughs> that we would cut out of these magazines and we'd put this collage on a, a big piece of plywood and that's what we would do all day is we would just target practice and nice. shoot at these things all day long, which sounds kind of fucked up, but um, we spent so much time with uh, with firearms and, and that eventually he got me shooting a, a 410, which I, I've got that. I think you've seen that 410 that I've had. Yep. It's pretty cool. It's a break action one that's super light. You could break it into pieces basically and throw it in your backpack, no problem. So I I did get into hunting sort of as a youth hunter and followed my dad around and we would go grouse hunting and and that. And I was really into it, but for some reason fell out of it. And, uh, you know, there comes a time, I don't know when you transfer from being a youth hunter into actually needing to get your own license, but what it came down to it, I never did follow through on it. And, mm-hmm. and that was the last I sort of ever, you know, was involved in hunting, even though I would sort of go out and, and, and be with them when they were, you know, looking for deer or whatever. We were never successful finding a deer. And so I was never really part of like a full on hunt. And maybe that's the reason why I never really got hooked on it. But mm-hmm. bird hunting, I was always very much interested in. And, and I thought when I finally did get my license a couple of years ago here, that I would only, you know, really be interested in bird hunting, but um, quickly changes once you start going out there and chasing deer around in that. But uh, so yeah, that's kind of my background as far as hunting, and it's not really that involved. But I got to a point where I was just not interested at all, and I felt like it was wrong and cruel to animals. Mm-hmm. But at a certain point, when you're fucking eating meat. <laughs> Um, you realize it came that from an animal. It came from an animal. So yeah, somebody did it. I do. I'm not going to make fun of somebody that's vegan or bust their balls about it. If that's their choice, then that's totally fine with me. But if you're a meat eater and you've got issues with hunting, then you probably haven't done your research and you don't understand the importance of conservation. Um, which is what we learned going through the core program. You kind of get an insight into how mm-hmm. important hunting actually is. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, like there's so many, um, like for me, I was into mountain biking, I was into skiing, I was into using public land right. for hiking and doing all that stuff. But for the most part, I don't think those are the people that are paying for the conservation effort. No. It's usually the hunters and their license fees that are paying for uh, the maintenance and its conservation of those lands, right? I did find so, a stat on um, basically the amount of money that comes in through hunting each year, and it's a staggering amount of money. So when you see that, you realize it is important, and hunters are, are a big part of conservation. And mm-hmm. and even, you know, it, it goes much further than just guys going out and slaughtering animals because it's fun. It's... It's nowhere near that. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some rednecks that 
give hunting a bad name, but we can talk yeah. more about that at a different point. But I, I think, um, especially here in the Okanagan, I think the farm to table organic food is very present here and people are, I think are fairly uh, fit and in good shape around here. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I really started to think about what I'm eating and and I feel like people are more conscious about what their intake of food is and where it's coming from. How did you feel that it's there's a becoming a bit of a shift in Yeah, big time. I think there's more evidence coming out now too that shows that um animals that eat grass and free range food like if they're a free range animal they're much healthier i th- i think um i was listening to joe rogan or something like that but they were saying that 50 percent um more omega fatty acids in those animals right so um, i think there's some evidence coming out now in studies that are being done that kind of show a direct correlation right um but i mean how more organic and free range can you get than taking an animal right out of the wilderness and uh and it, I mean, I think the other part of hunting that I never realized is how much effort uh, and um, thought goes into making the right shot so the animal actually doesn't suffer. Right. Um, it keeps suffering to a minimum. I mean, they're standing there, living their life, um, having lived a, l- a full life or a long life for that matter, and uh, all of a sudden they get hit with something and they're down on the ground, but... I mean, that's about as long as it takes. Ideally, it's not always the case, but... Yeah, if you look at the timeline of a, of an animal's life, that's just a pretty small blip, right? Yeah. And uh, if it is a good shot, that animal's not going to... You know, in some cases, they don't even know they've been hit, right? Yeah. So that's not always the case, and... Um, we'll get into that later, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I also got into gardening um, five years ago, I think, and we uh, we live in a small apartment, so we don't have our own yard, but there's community gardens that are popping up all over town here. And we were fortunate enough to get one. That's actually pretty hard to get on the list. But there's some weird connection and a lot of pride uh, when you grow your own stuff. And you know what's been put into the soil and the time that was put into growing those vegetables. So just that alone, I think, makes them taste better. I think they taste better anyways you know what i mean than shit that you would get at the grocery store that's not organic and people can argue about organic and if it's horseshit or whatever but i know from experience when you see if you compare something that's organic and not organic you can often tell the difference you know what i mean Mm -hmm. if you think about a organic strawberry they're often smaller but they're bright red in color and you look at something else that's been pumped full of who knows what, man. Mm-hmm. And the thing's the size of a fucking apple. And it's like this pale, like pinky color. And it has no taste. So really, I think that's all you have to, to do to gauge if something's good or not. Is mm-hmm. just look at it and taste it. And Yeah. Um, and it's common sense, too. Like, you can't expect an animal that's cooped up in a cage all its life to, to really be that healthy, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. So, and who knows what that thing's been eating, if it's been eating corn its whole life, which I don't think it should be soy and yeah. corn. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not uh, going to reap any rewards when we put it in our bodies, I don't think. No, I don't think so. Not as all. much, anyway. Um, we were able to, uh, I don't know if you remember, we were looking after that farm um, here in Kelowna, for about a month and we were looking after horses and chickens in that there and it was such a cool feeling because these chickens were able to run around on their own and kind of eat whatever of course we would throw stuff out for them but they were also able to eat worms and shit and whatever they could find basically but when you grab an egg from a chicken in the morning that's just been hatched and crack that into a frying pan and you can see the lush orange bright color it's like nothing you've ever seen in a grocery store. So there's like Mm -hmm. kind of all these stages for me when I start to realize like, oh my God, like food is, can be so much better. Um, And it's very simple, you know what I mean? It's, it's not that complicated, Mm -hmm. but once you've sort of experienced and you've, um, you've been able to eat these things and sort of discover them, you realize the benefits of it and how much better it is. And when you actually see the animal, the, the chicken that you're taking the egg from, 
it's a totally different thing. And I think that's what slowly led me into hunting. There's a few reasons why yeah. I got into it, but I feel like if I'm going to continue to eat meat, it's really important for me to be part of the process. Um, it would be a nice goal to only have meat that we harvested ourselves, really, and not have to buy stuff from a grocery store. So mm-hmm. that involves getting an elk or, or something mm-hmm. like that, but we'll get there eventually. Yeah. Um, so, and I mean, fishing is a big part of that too. Yeah. I think think we're both getting, well, I've gotten into fly fishing quite a bit too. Um, I started realizing as you get more kind of obsessed with hunting and that hunting season ends, it's pretty short. If you think about it, um, you need something else to supplement that. Definitely. That, um, piece in your life. So, um, BC in the interior especially is a very good um, fly fishing area. Um, so yeah, I've kind of gotten into that a lot too. I think this podcast, even though it's called the Rookie Hunter podcast, is really going to involve uh, evolve into fly fishing and and mm-hmm. um, you know even h- hiking and, and more so just outdoor stuff. Um, we're in between hunting seasons and kind of coming off the tail end of it. So that's what inspired us to start talking about hunting. But really, I think the show is going to be a lot about fishing as well because we're not too far off from getting out and doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the theme always seems to... Like that food theme is a huge piece, right? And I think that's why, for me, I really took the plunge and decided to go with you guys... Um, to the hunting course, right. firearms course. Um, I don't think it's something that I would have done on my own um, just because I was a little bit hesitant as to whether I wanted to get into it or not. Yeah, um, I didn't know a whole lot at that point. I wasn't reading a ton about it. Um, all I knew is that uh, the people that were into it were super into it. Right. <laughs> and I couldn't really understand why. But uh, if, yeah, we ended up going on the course and I was kind of thinking that um, I'd be the camp cook. I've been, I've been over the last few years, I've been really trying to get more into cooking, um, ingredients and all that kind of stuff. So for me, that was kind of my one big connection. The other one was, uh, like camaraderie and, yeah. and getting everybody out there to hang out. I mean, you can say, let's go on a camping trip or a hiking trip. Everybody's so busy with their lives. Yeah. And it's so hard to get people together sometimes Very to, much so. to do that. Right. But, if everybody's into hunting, it's almost like it's a priority on their list. Like yeah, and you, it becomes there, that thing, right? So you're still camping and you're still hiking and you're doing all those fun things. But you're kind of out there with a purpose and there's some weird connection or some, you know, primal link in our brains that when you start hunting it, I don't know, man, it does something and it, mm-hmm. you quickly become obsessed with it. It's uh I don't know if anyone's listening that hasn't got into hunting. I think they might not get that. But once you start, you'll quickly understand. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, when uh, when I was considering hunting, and this has sort of been going over like probably at least 10 years when my dad and my brother-in-law, my cousin, everybody was always trying to get me to come out hunting. And it was the same thing. I wasn't really into it, but I'm like, oh, maybe I could just be the camp cook. Yeah. <laughs> And I think everybody kind of thinks that. And then it evolved into, you know, just bird hunting until finally having my license. And I think being in the core program is what taught me the importance of conservation and in that it, it does make sense to go out and harvest these animals. It's actually mm-hmm. good for the population. So that's when it started to, you know, get away from being the camp cook and just bird hunting to, I can't wait to find a fucking deer. So mm-hmm. um, it's a weird process to go through and it's uh i mean if you if you're a type of person that likes to learn new things it's never ending oh like that that's the other thing is like just whether it's gear whether it's learning about animals whether it's learning about plants survival knots like anything you want to know um you can dive into it as deep as you want and that's the other one of the things that kind of I'm really interested in with this whole hunting thing is um, just learning the life skills. Right. I mean, you you got to learn how to make a fire or build a shelter or do a certain kind of knot in real life situ- 
situations yeah, right you've so be prepared for just about anything yeah and it helps you around the house it helps you it helps you throughout your life so yeah and just the fitness aspect of it is i think that's my favorite part is just hiking and throwing a bunch of weight on your back and going out there and um because october september november december those are kind of months where you're getting into winter and you're spending less time outdoors but it's so nice to have a a hobby in between summer and and getting into like full on winter when you yeah. know we can get out and ski and and all that kind of stuff actually the one i think the one moment where i realized that this was going to be like a rest of my life kind of thing was uh when we went out this was the first fall and we get up like pretty high elevation um and all the trees have turned up there so there's like uh, aspens and a bunch of other trees that were up there. And everything's like yellow, orange, um, red. And when I saw that, I'm thinking, I have never really had an excuse to come out at this time of year to this height in the mountains. And that time of day, too. And that time there. of day, yeah, you're up there bright and early. And the sun's just kind of coming over the mountain. And there's all like, it's just amazing. Yeah. And it gives you that purpose to go out there and do these things. And whether or not you get an animal, at that moment, I could care less. You win. I just wanted to go out there. Yeah. yeah. If you get something, it's it's really just a bonus. Um, let's talk about our first season, but let's go back a little bit. We've sort of touched on getting our license. And I think an a, important thing to to note is that if you have other friends that have you've talked about it with or, or know people that are interested together just like say we're going to do it we're going to sign up and get our hunting and fire alarms uh, f- firearms <laughs> license um because that's kind of what happened with us is i brought up the idea to you over beers or something like that uh i had the core manuals that were given to me and then uh, a friend of yours was also interested so it was kind of all these three things that um happened at once that led us to actually going and getting our mm-hmm licenses where six months before i hunting had never crossed my mind yeah exactly so it's kind so, of funny how life works sometimes yeah so i think that's really important is just if, if anyone's interested just fucking sign yourself up and do it so it was beginning of september of 2014 right um yep i think so where we did the course so that's exactly when hunting season starts basically so it was a three-day program, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really enjoyed it, all of it. Like, I found it super interesting. It probably comes down to the instructor, and um, like I said, he was really good. So pick somebody. Ask people who've done the core program uh, if they can recommend somebody. Because we ended up driving 45 minutes like out of our city to another one to do this because we heard that the guy was really good, and he was quite a bit cheaper for whatever reason, too, which doesn't matter as much but um so yeah highly recommend signing yourself up doing the course and uh, i think you said this before like even if you're not so much into hunting you do the program anyways because you learn a lot and, yeah i uh, think hunters fishermen uh camping mountain bike anything if you're out in the wilderness you should probably be uh taking that course like there's bear safety yeah um, what if you get lost a lot of survival stuff in there for sure so i don't know i think it's important i mean we live in bc so you're not here stones throw away from being in the wilderness right exactly. in most cities it doesn't take long even if you live in vancouver uh, really you could be out in the bush in 45 minutes right yep. from downtown vancouver so yeah and you don't want to be the guy thinking you can outrun the bear it's not gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> uh so we did the three-day thing we all passed we did really well it's pretty easy all you have to do is pay attention it's not like they just push you through it but a lot of you know what you learn is going to be actually in the field so you have to have some basic safety and uh, firearms understanding before you can get out there obviously um so no big deal to to pass the course um the only thing that delayed us from getting out right away i wish we'd like done it in august or something like that because then we would have had all of our licenses right away but it took some time for them to print them and send them, and mine got lost in the mail. So it wasn't really until 
I guess like late November. Yeah. So mid, did you have your mid license to, mid October or something like that? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember actually. I had mine a little earlier. Yeah. So I so. was able, we have a friend that um, we could go out with, which is kind of cool. So if somebody has their firearms license, you can go out with them. Um, so we were able to go out with him and then you ended up getting yours. So you and I could go out as a mm -hmm. duo, which was pretty cool. And eventually I got mine and I got so obsessed. I was going out almost every day by myself <laughs> once I had mine. Uh, and we're kind of lucky as far as like uh, being able to access the outdoors fairly quickly and i think from your house it's only 15 or 20 minutes drive mm -hmm. and you're hunting right away yeah if that yeah so we only had i guess a maximum of you know i guess just shy of two months where we were able to go out mm -hmm. somewhere around there yeah that was that was interesting that was kind of just let's go out there and see what happens pretty much yeah um we had a few opportunities and there's so many th things, so many angles we could look at this from, but not being prepared is mm -hmm. one of them. Not having proper equipment. My binoculars were dog shit. You didn't even have any. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so early on, I had a, an opportunity to shoot at a nice, I think it was a four point whitetail. Couldn't really tell because my binoculars were shitty, but this thing was only, I don't know, 150 yards from me. Yeah, <laughs> turned out to be a bush. Yeah, <laughs> no, I swear it was moving. Uh, but it was actually right, right early in the morning, and I had uh, pulled up, parked the truck, and looked up, and this thing was right up on top of a ridge, and uh, by myself, still very new to hunting, and I'm looking through the binoculars, and it had to have been, for me to shoot at, it had to be a whitetail. It couldn't be a mule deer at that point mm -hmm. because of the season. And I was like 99.9% .9 sure that it was a whitetail. It definitely was, but I was doubting myself. And then uh, the other thing too was if I had shot at it, because it was right on top of the ridge, the bullet, if I had missed or if it traveled right through the deer, it had a risk of sort of passing through. And, mm -hmm. you know, if there's somebody back there, it's very unlikely that there would be somebody, but there's a risk of fucking yeah. shooting somebody. Which, which is kind of a testament to the course that we took, right? Yeah, exactly. And that you paid attention, but also that we had a good teacher. Yeah. So on two accounts, because one, yeah. you didn't shoot because you didn't know what the animal was. And two, recognizing that that bullet could have sailed off into exactly. nowhere land. So I think it would have been fine and, and everything like that, but there were so many things going through my head, so many questions and so much uncertainty and um, doubt and 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 that like it was a perfect opportunity really i could have probably moved forward and, and tried to get closer to it or whatever but i just wasn't ready at that point and i was you know i think i knew that in my head too i'm like don't do this because you don't really know if i did shoot it i wouldn't know what to do next i was by myself and so i think if anybody's out there and especially in your first year if you have any even the smallest ounce of hesitation or doubt don't don't do it man just mm -hmm. wait until you're 100 percent confident yeah because, you might end up wrecking the meat anyways yeah exactly or fucking killing somebody or yeah or just starting off with a really shitty experience and yeah that's not a way to get into it so confidence you need to be 110 percent confident in all areas of hunting yeah with your shooting and you knowing what to do after you shoot it because that's where all the work really comes in um so that was my first opportunity and like i said there was a whole handful of reasons why i didn't shoot at that thing um uh, other than that like we were going up and seeing lots of sign one area we were going to we weren't seeing jack shit although you kind of had an opportunity with a nice white tail buck too yeah so that would have been november right like it was kind of around the rut time yeah and there was a couple deer that were wrestling each other. They were just young, um, maybe two points or something like that. Mm. But I no, mean, no, no, go back. You also had the opportunity with Landon when I wasn't there. Oh, yeah, that one was, that was, I still think about that sometimes because <laughs> we were out in this blind, kind of out in a uh, clear cut, looking down towards uh, this creek. Um, 
and there was a you could tell it was a travel corridor um the trees kind of jetted out along the creek um so you can tell the deer were moving there so we hadn't seen anything we were sitting there for a long time i decided to pull out my deer call i was just kind of playing around like first season we don't know what we're doing <laughs> yeah so i'm kind of just like blowing on this thing every once in a while and uh sun started to go down couldn't see a whole lot but um yeah the th- the three of us were all looking down to this creek and then all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye I see this movement and i'm not kidding like 30 yards away this big uh, white tail buck was standing there and it was probably like four or five point um and it was just walking as slow as possible with his head down like see, almost like he was listening and smelling at the same time right? you had called him in though right yeah so i'm sure because i was kind of like calling um Every 10, like a doe right or something yeah yeah so uh yeah i'm sure he was coming to check out what that was um what we didn't realize and um, it was good that it happened but obviously the deer call is going to put the deer downwind of you so he must have kind of gone around the back and he was going to check out what it was i looked over and i saw him and obviously he saw me uh i reached for the gun and he took off how many yards away was he like 30 yards Jesus. yeah no like it scared the crap out of me because i didn't know what it was right but like this thing was big it was big and like silvery and, wow like big rock on them um that's actually the last time that i saw a deer uh, that big so far right in the last in the last season we had a full season since but yeah i, I know he's up there so i do want to go back but um th- yeah that was pretty funny i was the only one that actually saw him so on the way down i was just going off about this big deer and he was only 30 yards away and landon and uh sebastian there were just they were frustrated they didn't see anything the whole day right so that's funny yeah so lesson learned every time you go out there you learn something every single time yeah for sure yeah so the third and last opportunity we had was a pretty interesting one, and, and that would have been, like you said, mid-November, do you think? Yeah. So, so, so by that point, there was a lot of snow up there. Mm-hmm. Last year, we had way more snow uh, in that area than we did this year. Yeah. And it was fucking cold that day, too. It was cold, yeah. So we got up there. Um, basically, it was still dark. We, uh, we kind of have a, a usual route <clears throat> that we we do in this particular area. So we follow a uh, forest service road basically as we can, as far as we can get on it, it becomes pretty rough. And then we park the truck, walk, and then uh, there's a spot where we can branch off and start trekking through the bush a little bit. And then that meets up with a gas line. And then from there you can go a number of different directions. So we kind of have the same route that we would do each time because we kept seeing deer sort of in the same area but that particular morning we kind of crept up behind this ridge and we saw a doe and two fawns correct Mm -hmm. and then uh so you know one of the cool things about being out there is you see deer and then you just sit there and observe them which is very cool on its own but shortly after it was again still in the rut two bucks came running over top of the ridge up behind where this doe and two fawns were and from there it kind of got more and more intense because they were wrestling with each other and doing all kinds of things that I had never seen deer do. Have you ever witnessed anything like that? No. So to see them in the rut and to be ramming each other and fuck is pretty cool, man. Mm -hmm. So we were downwind from these guys and we were able to basically creep up, blow them. When we saw them, they were probably, geez, I don't know. 800 yards, 1,000 yards away from us, like quite a distance a ways. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were able to kind of sneak off to the left and then climb up this ridge unseen and come out right on top. Poke our heads over the top, which like I'm still, uh, that was a good plan. I think at that point, even though we'd only been hunting for a couple months, we were uh, reading a lot of articles and trying to like, um, but we were thinking a lot too, right? Yeah. At that point, we were starting to use our, our heads a little bit and planning out things in advance. And 
Well, I was <clears throat> for sure. Yeah, no, I think like we did everything like by the book, like everything up to that point. Mm-hmm. It gets a little hairy after at that point, but yeah. everything up to that point was absolutely perfect. I think everything was mm-hmm. in our favor. Like basically, it couldn't go any better as far as wind and and location and mm-hmm. like the route that we were able to take and stuff like that. Um, I'm gonna take it from here. Yeah, so we kind of pop our heads over the top of that ridge. Um, there were a couple bucks down in a. Um, it was like a little basin, right? Yeah. They're about, uh, I don't know, 100 yards or so. Away. Yeah, 100, 120 yards away. And uh, yeah, I, I, we kind of looked at each other and um, I guess we agreed like, well, I'm going to take the shot. Yeah. Um, you were looking through your binoculars. I kind of set up. Um, There's a little bit of a, um, like a, a ridge of snow on the top of that mountain. Just a yeah, snow drift that had built up. From yeah. W- wind over time and stuff like that. Yeah. So, well, like this is going back to firearms experience, but um, when I grew up, I didn't really have a whole lot of exp- uh, firearms experience. So like buying the new rifle, getting it sighted in, doing all that thing, it was a bit of a battle. But, yeah, you uh, had just bought a brand new rifle and it was a bit of a pain in the ass. Yeah, like it, I don't know, uh, the bore sighting I don't think was helping me out too much. So we tried to get it sighted in. I ended up having to bring it back to like 25 yards and starting all over yeah. again and went through a box and it just wasn't a super pleasant experience. So um, I don't know, after this day I actually went back and, and made some adjustments. But um, anyways, we... Get, I was getting the, the shot set up, um, let the shot go, a bunch of deer scattered. Um, and I was looking through the binoculars. You were I looking through the binoculars. Of, of everything because of the blast of snow. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, at that point, we weren't sure if anything was hit. So, um, if I remember correctly, the doe and the fawns sort of scattered. And it seemed like they were going like every different direction. So I didn't even know which deer you had shot at that point. But the two bucks kind of stood there for a minute, didn't they? Yeah. And you were able to fire off another one. And at that point, there was just deer going every direction. Yeah, exactly. So at that point, we uh, waited a couple minutes just to settle down a little bit. But upon traveling down to where um, the deer were, uh, we ended up finding a bit of a blood trail, very small blood trail. Um, and then we walking around kind of investigating a little bit. Um, there was actually a deer laying down beside a tree that was not too far away, maybe 25 yards away from where we were standing. I didn't see the fucking thing, man. No, so it, it jumps up and it just books it for this little group of trees, like runs right by us, like just ripping through the trees. Um, we're trying to look in the trees to see where it went. Turns out the thing had ran through the trees, exited, went right back up to where we took the shot from, yeah. and it kind of took off that way, right? So I think that was another lesson we learned. If you're going to take a shot at something, give it some time. Wait. We just and, assumed uh, that we had missed. Yeah. But. Yeah. I mean, the shot, you'll know if the shot feels right or wrong. And mm-hmm. for me, it didn't feel right. Right. Um, so I kind of figured I had missed. But then upon, like when we saw the blood trail, I'm thinking, oh crap, this is not a good situation. Yeah. See the deer, it obviously injured, runs, takes off. And now at that point, we both realized we have a long rest of the day ahead of us. So, um, yeah, we take off following the blood trail. We must have walked for, I don't know, for over four hours. At least, yeah. Yeah trying to find this thing and we were always just behind it it, would, it kept sitting down it'd get up it'd walk a little ways it'd sit down get up and walk a little ways yeah. um the blood trail kind of got smaller and smaller and smaller and we ended up seeing it at one point um it was kind of holding its leg a little bit so i think we i clipped it in the leg right um but you, you could tell that it was kind of just grazed um so the last time I saw it, it was running full bore, man. Yeah. And uh, it looked perfectly healthy. 
and it's and, and it's not just me trying to convince myself that the deer was okay and it's actually upon reflection that i realized that it, it was okay in the moment i'm like fuck me we wounded this thing and i was kind of upset about it and especially because it was our first shot at a a deer but we later we're able to look up um, in Stephen Ronella's book. It shows you the different colors of blood and what kind of shot that would be. Mm-hmm. And um, we were actually able to determine that it would have just been a graze. And um, the the trail got smaller and smaller and smaller and it was almost non-existent by the time we had to call mm-hmm. it quits. The amount of hours we spent following that thing, it's very much a blur because you realize you have a responsibility to find out if this thing is okay or whatever. So I, it felt like it, you know, when we took the shot, it was early in the morning. And I feel like when we gave up, it was pretty late in the day by that point. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think we could have gone any longer. We did everything we could. And, and I'm 100% confident that deer survived. It was fine. Yeah. But such a, it's a, it was a crazy experience. Yeah. And that one stuck with me for a while. And um, looking back, it's a great experience, and I think it's going to happen to any hunter. The shot is not always going to be perfect. A deer might mm-hmm. move right when you shoot, or there might be something that you know yeah. throws and you it, off or whatever. And a lot of it comes down to um, practice with your firearm, too. Yeah. Like for me, I've been working a lot more on taking shots. Um, at that point, having reading all these articles about firearms and Um, like you got angle compensation and all that, like that shot was a pretty steep angle shot and having read, uh, articles about, well, if it's on any kind of angle, it's actually a shorter distance than the actual straight path to the animal. Yeah. Um, all that stuff's kind of going through your head. And if you don't have a lot of it practice with it, you start overcompensating for things that you probably shouldn't have (laughs) compensated for at all. Right. So I think that kind of factors in. But, yeah, uh, there's no substitute for practice. No, and I think that's going back to my point earlier is that if you're not 100% confident for any reason, whatever it might be, just don't shoot. I think we, you and I were pretty excited at that point because we'd spend a lot of time out there. So mm-hmm. it was sort of just go for it. But I, I wouldn't say that we shouldn't have shot at it or, or we should have done anything different. It just was the outcome yeah. of it. And it, uh, you know whatever it happens yeah so that was a huge learning experience and um i don't know if you have anything else to add to that but i think we learned so much from that and like 90 percent of of that day we did right actually almost 100 mm-hmm. percent. man it was just a wasn't the best shot for yep. whatever reason and uh we did everything we were taught to do as far as getting up there and setting up the shot and mm-hmm. and you know going as long as we could to make sure the animal was was fine so yeah success really without actually harvesting a deer but yeah I and guess, i think that's another another thing too for people that don't have a lot of experience with firearms or hunting is um i always kind of had this idea that you shoot a firearm and it's like a laser beam right yeah like you watch movies and all this stuff and you just get this idea um that you it goes where you aim but that's not really the case. You got gravity. Um, yeah. There's a lot of ballistics involved. For sure. Um, but there, that bullet's out traveling on an arc. Um, so for people to say, well, you're going out there with the gun. And um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's obviously an advantage over the animal. Right. But it's not a, as easy as people think. No. So. Yeah. And I've heard people say that the weakest link in a firearm is the shooter. So if the thing is set up properly and it's shooting the way it should be, the rest is your responsibility to kind of know, you know, how you should be shooting at 200 or 300 or 90 yards. You know what I mean? You should know all those things and, and uh, again, be 100% confident because if the thing's sighted in properly, you've only got yourself to blame for, for not sure. hitting a target because, yeah. Yeah. So get out there and practice and i think that's something you and i need to do fairly soon here once the snow is a bit more melted we can hit the range and you yep. build up the confidence again it's good to do it every every year and uh even if you think you're a great shot just go out and do it yeah. some more i think I'm, i might have been a little over 
confident because when I sighted in my rifle, the thing was bang on. But again, it's like a confidence boost that like mm-hmm. nailed it right exactly where I wanted it to be. I'm like, okay, fuck it. I took two shots. She sighted in. Let's go hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So anyways, do lots of reading and there's tons of books and obviously information on the internet and YouTube videos and all that good stuff. Um, but to sum up our first year, those were kind of the major events. One of the cool things for me was once there was snow on the ground, you really get to understand how these animals travel and, and where they're hanging out. And that was kind of neat because when there isn't any snow on the ground and you're not seeing it, like, fuck, is there even any deer out here? Mm-hmm. Until it does, the snow does fall and you're like, holy shit, they're all over the place. And um, especially if, if you're going to an area over and over again, once you know where all the tracks are and where they're hanging out, it kind of makes you more confident for the following season. But um, yeah. that sums it up for me. Is there anything you wanted to add to the first year? Uh, no, I don't Our think first, so. First season? Yeah, no, the first season was relatively short, but yeah. I think we learned some uh, valuable lessons. Totally. So what's the difference between that and the second season? Well, we were successful in the second season. Um, it was a... I don't I, you totally I went into it with a totally different perspective and so much more confidence and so much excitement and with all those things we just talked about it just raises your your confidence to a whole new level. I'm sure we'll keep getting better and better each year. But when you're going out feeling good and you're in an area where you you know there's deer um it's a totally different experience and um we were checking out the same area again this year which is very close to your house and um this year i felt there was a lot more a lot more guys and a lot less deer Mm -hmm. so that's uh inspired us to go elsewhere and we ended up doing um i don't want to give too much information away but we went into this park area that's um off limits to motor vehicle um and how many days did we spend in there three days or something like that uh yeah was it four yeah i guess it was four so we uh we were able to go in with cal's truck and set up a really good camp um which is key to good hunting is to have an area where you can come back and have a good meal and a fire and access to water we brought big jugs of water and, and all that but beyond where we were camped it's like untouched wilderness there's trails really good trails in there but um, such a neat experience to be out there. And during those four days, we didn't see one person. Or no, we did see two guys in the morning, but that was it. And we were going a different direction than them. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so we did how many kilometers of hiking do you think? The one day we did a massive We did hike. 20 kilometers in one day. And how many feet of vertical is that? Like 2,000 up and 2,000 down. <laughs> so it was a long fucking day. Yeah. And um, this trip wasn't successful in any way, but like we <laughs> we got to to know this area, and, and we'll probably go back there again this year. With you know, I think we saw a few black bears. We saw one big, huge fucking black yeah. bear, that and then was, we saw one on the way back too, a uh, mama bear, uh, two cubs. Yeah, yeah. we did see uh, a mule deer, a uh, doe with two fawns. Yeah. And I swear I saw a massive mule deer on that one little knoll, but it was like a kilometer or two away. What is that? My optics weren't uh, good enough. Remember we were kind (laughs) of, this is at the top of the mountain when we did the 2000 foot up. Okay. And we kind of went around and then we were kind of coming back down and I was looking out towards like the uh, southeast or southwest. Yeah. And I'm kind of looking and I see these, I swear they were antlers, but, uh, yeah, we had sat there and looked at them for a while. Just, oh yeah, come I on, about just that. move yeah. so we can tell if that's a deer or not. But, uh, I don't know. We never got there. It's a stump deer. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure it was, but, uh, a good reason to get a spotting scope. Yeah. But, uh, we've got one now. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That still uh, holds some promise for me. I still think there's a chance that was a big deer that was sitting there. <laughs> I will say it was. <laughs> yeah. We'll get him uh, this season. Yeah. Uh, actually, a highlight for me, which was like milliseconds in length, was actually hearing an elk call for the very first time. I've never heard that before. Have you? Mm-hmm. No. 
that was the first morning that we went out and we're like, holy fuck, like this is going to be an amazing hunting trip because yeah. we had only been out for probably a half hour at that point and the sun was just coming up and we hear this elk screaming in the distance mm -hmm. and that was the last we heard of that. But if you've never heard an elk in the wild like that, holy shit, that's quite something to hear. Mm -hmm. It's kind of haunting in a way. But that kind of sums up <laughs> that trip. <laughs> It was, yeah, no, I was good from a camp perspective. Yeah. Like we... Uh, and exercise, holy fuck. Oh, yeah, exercise, um, kind of how much weight you want to put in your pack for something like that because mm -hmm. as you get closer to the top of that mountain, you start thinking, well, what if I got an elk here? What if I got a full-grown yeah. mule deer? Yeah. What if I got... And I'm thinking, uh, like, there's a certain point where you kind of think, I don't know if we're going to be able to get this thing back if we shot it here. Well, that's um, a great point because we went in there with the thought of either getting an elk or a mule deer. Yeah. Had we shot an elk, what the fuck would we have done, man? No. Because we had never even uh, field dressed an animal at that point. Yeah. A deer, we probably would have figured it out, but an elk... We would have been sitting there going, what the f we would have had to do so many Multiple trips. Multiple trips. And, you know, I guess if you consider the kilometers going back and forth, mm -hmm. that would have been over two days. Mm -hmm. it, like, especially if we had caught it, shot it later in the day. Yeah. So and then have there's. To hang this thing. And, and then it was pretty warm too. So there's a risk mm -hmm. of the meat spoiling. Spoiling. So, and there's fun. risk of um, predators being on the meat yeah. every time you go back, right? Like, I don't think you want to go back to that meat any more than you have to no you kind of ideally get it all out in one trip yeah two trip i think you want to be really careful walking back into that area definitely if something else has claimed it you kind of got to give it to them but we had came across that um that spot where <clears throat> somebody had shot a, a deer and uh there was a bunch of birds there do you remember that big huge bald eagle that flew out in front of us mm -hmm. and scared the shit out of me anyways mm -hmm. wasn't expecting it but um yeah, so I think a deer would have been okay. Still, yeah, consider your pack weight. I did throw more weight in my pack on that trip, sort of just to see how much I could handle and mm -hmm. and that. So again, that that whole trip was a bit more of a alluring experience and kind of knowing what our boundaries were. And thank God we didn't get an elk or a deer, really. <laughs> yeah. So if we go back there um, this season. We'll probably take a different approach to it and mm -hmm. maybe come through on the lake and set up a different camp. I don't know. We'll see. We'll have to talk about that a bit more. Yeah. The other crazy thing with that trip was it was October. Uh, thanks, was it Thanksgiving weekend? Mm -hmm. I think it was, which is different in Canada if you're listening from the States. But uh, it was pretty warm and we got a crazy thunderstorm that rolled through. And this particular area had been... Um, ripped apart by uh, forest fires. So there's a lot of standing trees that have been dead for 10 years now. And uh, this storm rolled in probably, I don't know, 9 o'clock at night, just after we had eaten dinner. And all of a sudden, winds picked up, thunder and lightning. Lightning, that's a little too close for comfort. Yeah. But the wind started knocking over all these trees, so we could hear them that is probably one of the most terrifying sounds that you could ever hear when you're sleeping in a tent. Yeah, it sounds like rifle shots going oh, off. Oh, yeah, it sounded like we were under attack. So there's trees yeah. falling down all around us. We didn't see any of them until the next day when we were out hiking again. There was trees falling all over the place. But God damn, that was terrifying. And even after the uh, storm was gone and it had calmed down, just the abuse that those trees took, they just continued to crack and fall over throughout the night too. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> Kelly and I were sleeping in the same tent, and I remember one falling over, and you shot up like a rocket. <laughs> oh, man, I, I was unzipped the tent and looked out, <laughs> and uh, we'd rigged up that tarp over the oh, over the, this table. That was gone, yeah. And the uh, fire, right? Yeah. And, yeah, I just I unzip, I poke my head out, and the tarp is no longer a full square. It's the triangle and the, the one end it's is just folded over. It's and... like hitting me in the face because <laughs> <laughs> it was just flying all over the place. And it, our tent was about 20 feet back. But yeah. yeah, this corner of the tarp was just smashing on the side of the tent. And yeah, that was uh, pretty terrifying, really. It was, it was interesting. It's good to um, find a backcountry spot that isn't too backcountry yet. 
and right. go through those experiences. Um, cause I mean, it's no motor vehicles, but at the same time we had, um, the truck in, like you can get close enough to that park where you could leave your truck and yeah. then you could camp just a little ways in. Yeah. So it's nice to have that option when you're going to try your first kind of yeah. outdoor hunting trip. Another thing is bring a fucking chainsaw. We got lucky that the road that we came in on is a one way. So I had a tree falling down. Yeah. I had a handsaw. We would have been sawing a tree there for, forever. Oh man. Or at least one of those um, pocket chainsaws. Yeah. Like the, the roll up ones. Yeah. So I had a shitty one with me, but yeah, would have got us out of that situation, but yeah, chainsaw. Man, oh man. But um so the trip after we finished all that, again, there's not much more to explain. It was just great hiking and great scenery and um just cool to be in an area that's so untouched like that. But the uh final day we packed up and decided to sort of continue hunting on our our way back. And we stopped uh, not too far away from your place. We probably, I don't know, another 45-minute drive. We would have been back to your house. But we decided to hop out with the the 22 and see if we could find some grouse. And we did shoot a grouse. So mm-hmm. we, we were just successful. We, that was our first kill. Yeah, which is hilarious <laughs> because, <laughs> like, both of our wives, well, yeah, we. so we say we're we're headed home. We're almost there. So we get there after four days of this big hunting trip, yeah, show they, up with one grouse. <laughs> because we've been hunting for a while at that point, they said, you guys better either stop talking about hunting or if you guys go out and do this trip, you better not come back until you got something. Yeah. <laughs> show so up we, with a grouse. With a grouse and we fried, fried it up. Fried it up. <laughs> so yeah. we came back with something. We were, it was good. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. It was worth the hundred dollars in gas and two hundred dollars in food and yeah everything else we, and uh, cut one gross man we, we ate so well during that trip yeah i don't know like the um the lunch meat and pepperoni and all that stuff you got there from the specialty store that was a lifesaver yeah because what i found was it was hard to eat in the morning one you're excited to it's super early like it's four oh, it's five pitch, in the morning right? out there yeah um i personally find it hard to eat that early so you kind of have your coffee and you have a granola bar or something and you kind of take off but make sure you got your food crammed with food because yeah, you're going to be burning calories made a bunch of sandwiches and had some pepperoni yeah. and dried fruit and and that so we were well taken care of in the food department and thank god we were yeah but yeah so, uh, second season, we were successful. We were. What's the story behind that? Well, this was the area that we were talking about that was really close to Kelly's place. And, um, again, up super early. Kelly and I were, are more so um, morning hunters. So we were, because it's not far from his house, it was still really dark when we got up there. And uh, to... I don't know how many does crossed the road. This is before, not the one that we got, but first thing, remember when those other guys were there as well? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember this part of the story. So when we were driving oh, yeah, up yeah, there, yeah. we saw the does that ran across the road in yeah, front of us. There's a few. And then we went up further up this uh, forest service road and parked and thought, okay, maybe these deer will come out into this field here. And uh, so we waited for them. I crawled down. Kelly was kind of keeping a watch up from above to see if he could see anything. Um, and I went further down to this little gully and got pretty close to these deer, but it was still too dark at that point. And, uh, and I, as I got further down there, I looked up and I saw that there was two other hunters watching the same deer. So I was kind of in a situation where I was a little bit unsure of, if these guys knew that I was there or whatever. So I was kind of, it's just a weird feeling when, it almost feels like you're in competition with these other guys and you know we're all looking at the same deer and who got there first so i'm like fuck this this doesn't feel right this isn't the kind of experience that i want so i sort of wave my hands at them to let them know that i was down there and don't fucking shoot me basically actually i was heading around on the top side and uh i had waved to them a little earlier and i i just walked straight to them 
let them know what was Yeah, happening. because I didn't know they knew you were down there, yeah. and they were looking straight towards you. I didn't know if they thought, well, we saw those deer down there. So I walked over to them um, and basically said, hey, just so you know, I we have another hunting partner that's down there. Yeah. And then they ended up turning around and leaving. But, um, yeah, kind of thought a little bit about that. You don't want to interrupt people's hunting, obviously, but when it's a safety issue. Well, oh, yeah, I was getting pretty paranoid down there. And that's, you know, guys are excited because they saw a deer and they see movement mm-hmm. not everybody's going to make the smart decision and hold off and make sure yeah. guys get shot man it happens so that that whole situation just didn't feel right even if those deer were right in front of me just knowing that there was guys there as well it just i don't know it just doesn't feel it's not the experience that i want from mm-hmm. hunting i want to be out there like just back country. you and i back country yeah. nobody else around like no pressure from from anything like that Mm -hmm. so we got the fuck out of there as fast as we could basically and then ended up going to where we normally do kind of do our normal routine um so i explained this before already we go up the forest service road this time kelly and i decided to split around this uh what would you call that little just a little mountain small mountain Mm -hmm. so kelly continued on the forest service road i hooked a left and kind of went through the brush a little bit and was going to go up onto the gas line and then Kelly would kind of meet me because they meet up again the the gas line and the forest service road sort of connect yeah, again on the back side of that mountain yeah so we split up um did our usual thing didn't see anything and, and Kelly and I met where we always do on the the gas line and assuming there was nothing around we sort of just started talking and we weren't being that quiet or or anything like that. And all of a sudden we see three white tail does running up on this little mountain that we had just both done a circle around. Somehow neither of us saw them, but I think we put pressure on them and pushed them right into the center of this thing. So we were pretty quick to act. You like a fucking ninja threw down your tripod for me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't know where that came from, but the deer had, they saw us at that point. They were probably only, less than 100 yards away running across this ridge while we were on the gas line Mm -hmm. and uh by the time i was set up they were moving again and i couldn't Mm -hmm. take a shot at them so they went down the back side of the mountain which was perfect because i could then go down into this little gully where there's a sort of a little swamp area and then climb back over up top of the mountain which is small we're saying mountain but it's small little thing there Mm-hmm. And then Kelly hooked off back down the gas line to see if he could see them. Um, so Try I, to cut him off. Yeah, exactly. So we're trying to come up with a way to sort of round him up again. But I came up over top of the the mountain, and they hadn't gone too far. The three white-tailed does were just on the other side of the thing, probably 70 to 80 yards away from me. So the, the biggest one of the group and the one that I was going after was looking right at me, and she was stomping her her feet on the ground and stuff like that which was interesting but I was super ready so I had like a little monopod thing that's not that sturdy but it's enough to kind of rest on and and get your um, bearings a little bit and I didn't have time to put the rangefinder. it was so close that I didn't even need to figure that out and I knew I had no. to be pretty quick with it but um, got my rifle out and everything was ready and uh, put the sight on her shot it and uh <laughs> It sort of it reminded me of like a unicorn fucking the way it kicked up. So it came up on its back legs right after I shot it and fell over and was dead like mm. instantly. Yeah, it didn't move. Didn't move at all. I didn't you see any it. movement at all. Yeah. So you um, shot it right through the front shoulder, yeah. basically. And while a little was, forward yeah. we learned. But uh yeah, a bit that was far. a good shot. I mean it But it, it was, was kind of um it it was looking at me on an angle. So the way that shot went through was almost perfect because it went through Mm. i think i might have clipped it right in the windpipe actually and then it came out through her back shoulder yeah um because remember there was blood sort of like bubbling there and stuff like that so that is usually an indicator of a lung shot or windpipe or whatever so yeah not exactly where i placed it but it was a fatal shot and it was instant so this time we waited and uh i think kel phone me or was that while i was taking the shot My yeah phone well because we split but... up so you went over the top of that knoll and i was 
I was um, more to the right. But at the end of the day, I don't want to get like I don't know where you yeah, where you yeah. are exactly. I think we had an idea, so I, I wasn't expecting like that you were going to be pointing anything in my direction. But I thought uh, mm-hmm. it's, it, we spent a couple minutes here. I'm going to give him a call. We have we have um, um, basically uh, everything on on mute or silent or vibrate or whatever. So. Yeah, we know just to check our phone every once in a while. Yeah, so I, I gave you a call and. <laughs> yeah, so it goes to voicemail, <laughs> and then right as it goes to voicemail, I could, I finally saw where you were, and you were setting up the shot, and you looked pretty intense. So I thought, hmm, I don't know if this is the right time to be calling them. And uh, right as it goes to voicemail, you fired your shot. So I'm pretty sure that voicemail <laughs> message is you taking the shot, <laughs> and me going, uh, I think you just shot a deer, and then no, I just I hung think, up. I think I checked right after, and all I could hear was you breathing. <laughs> 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 yeah other end but then uh yeah so that experience of shooting your your first animal had it been the first year i think i would have felt totally different but knowing that i shot the animal it was exciting and it's a I, i don't even know if i can really describe the feeling of you have a moment of sort of remorse and um you feel bad but that Mm -hmm. was pretty small for me i don't know how you felt yeah no i think even when you're taking the shot, there's adrenaline and um, a sense of responsibility yeah. in what you're doing. And I don't, like a lot of people see pictures of hunters holding up a, a deer or yeah. doing all this thing with a big smile on their face. And uh, I think we've talked about that a lot is the smile's not necessarily, I killed this. Yeah. It's the amount of work that you put into it. Um and yeah, I don't know. It's hard to explain. It is, but I, I think it is exactly what you're saying. It's there's so much time and and so much reading and so much effort, so much hiking, so much even money that you put into mm-hmm. that small moment. Mm-hmm. It's very small if you compare it to. Yeah, all, it's like catching the biggest fish, right? Yeah, like you can go out fishing and catch a bunch of little like eight, 10 inch trout, yeah. but you catch a 20, 30 inch trout and it, you're going to be smiling in that yeah. picture, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. It's just that like when you're talking mammals, I think people have a more, they have a deep connection to, um, to that animal, right? Definitely. Um, whereas a fish, people are like, yeah, it's a fish. What's, what's, a, yeah, no one really cares what's a big deal? You. Like, yeah, I'm sure it was exciting when you reeled that yeah. sucker in. Yeah. But, um, that's the other thing with hunting is, like the other thing I mentioned that people think the bullets are going in a straight line. I think the other thing people think is that you just go out there and you find a deer and you shoot it. Right. Well, it, how long did it take us to find that doe? Um, yeah. I mean, this isn't even a buck. No. Um, but we thought let's, it was doe season mm-hmm. and we wanted to get something and go through the process, get some meat, um, do all that kind of thing. Right. So, yeah. um, and even just to get that, it took, two years yeah exactly so um i think that's why people smile right it's it's about the achievement it's about kind of what you're made of and how much patience you have and mm-hmm. all yeah that it's just kind of stuff. everything coming together in that moment yeah yeah but um yeah and i was like there was no absolutely no hesitation in taking that shot which again yeah. i think is so important and i think the longer we hunted the higher the stakes get yeah right like you kind of think what well, why am i like yeah it's nice to be out here and it's nice to do all this stuff but at the end of the day i also want to get meat out of it too that was mm-hmm. one of the main reasons that we started doing this originally so, i sort of thought oh i only want to shoot box and I'm not interested in does, but, but it again, it changes once you start to do the research and you realize it's just important to um, control yeah. the doe population. It is the you can't just shoot yeah. out the box and have a bunch of does running around. Yeah, there's and, a reason there's a doe season too. Yeah. And it, the, the whole purpose for us, we're not trophy hunters, it's just to have meat. So it didn't take long for us to sort of decide whatever we see out there, we're gonna go after. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, that was a cool experience. And then after you shoot an animal, that's when things get 
really interesting because you have to field dress it, which we had never done. But um, both of us had watched videos and done yeah. lots of reading. And I think, um, you know, if you've got a basic understanding, it's um, it's intimidating. But as long as you have a, an idea of what you should be doing and how it should be done, you can navigate it pretty easily on your own. You'll figure yeah. it out. But, I think... Um, uh, what helped me a lot was um, watching those videos on YouTube yeah. and desensitizing yourself um, yeah, right off sure. the bat. But then also treating it just like another part of the job. Mm-hmm. Like, don't think too much about it. it. It is what it is. You're out there hunting. It's another step in the process and you move on. Yeah. I think a lot of people um, kind of get hung up on that piece. Um, and it wasn't as bad as I had expected. I'm not sure. Did you feel the same way? Yeah, it wasn't as bad. Yeah. Um, when we did the core program, I remember he showed us a video of a guy uh, field dressing. I don't know if it was a deer or an elk, but he cut into the, the stomach and it fucking mm. blew up in his face. Yeah, so fortunately that was, we didn't <laughs> experience that. That was my biggest concern was to like accidentally nick something. With that, you also risk spoiling the meat if that gets into it and so i was really paranoid about cutting into it and hitting something that i wasn't to but i had a a gut hook and you had a really nice surgical blade so we just took our time we probably you know we weren't going super fast but there's no reason to really Mm -hmm. um we were able to open it up and um cut through the rib cage and get all that stuff the way we needed it to and it comes out pretty easy really yeah I mean, um, we had a couple moments where you're kind of stuck at a certain yeah, exactly. point, but yeah. um, we figured it out. Yeah. And, and it, like you say, it's pretty intuitive. It is. Yeah. And it's amazing how, like, once you get in there and then you cut the windpipe, pretty much just comes sliding out into a big pile. Yeah, and then uh, you're pretty much... At roll. that point, it feels to me like... Uh, you know the Rocky videos where he's punching the meat in the cooler? <laughs> yeah. Like, at that point, okay, now this is meat. Mm-hmm. Um, once you get there, it's kind of a whole other, like, skinning and butchering the meat. <clears throat> to yeah. me, it wasn't as big of a deal as actually getting all that stuff out. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, that's sort of, like, the main thing is to get that out of there. And then, um, so we were able to, to, to gut it and everything, and then... Uh, Fortunately, where we were, we were pretty close to that Forest Service road. Even though it's in shitty condition, you were able to get the truck a little bit closer, and we didn't have to drag it out uh, too long of a ways. But while mm-hmm. you were heading down to get the truck, I was waiting there with the deer, and we heard guy outs moving in, mm-hmm. and one that was getting closer and closer and closer. So I was up there. <laughs> get another one loaded. With the, just sitting there with the deer, and this thing was getting closer and closer and closer, so I was ready to almost have to pull the trigger on that thing but luckily it stayed mm-hmm. away i was yelling at it and stuff i didn't want to shoot it but it's kind yeah. of a the animals know right away there was birds starting to come in and it's pretty interesting man and yeah they know what a gun a gunshot brings yeah i went up there a week after we shot the deer and the gut pie was completely gone so it's amazing how well it gets cleaned up um yeah, pretty fascinating. So it's yeah. it's kind of neat that all that stuff you left behind doesn't just sit there and rot. It, it was yeah. all eaten. There was some of the intestine left, and that was it. Yeah. If you didn't know that a deer had been shot there, I knew the exact locations I was able to go and look. But if you just walked by, you'd never even know that an animal was shot there. Yeah. But um, which side note, I would recommend the uh, Havilon, the Peranta, that surgical blade. Yeah, that thing's crazy sharp. Pretty awesome. Yeah. The only thing I'm worried about is, like, if you're in the back country, you got to be super careful with that thing. Like, one nick on that on yourself, man, and that thing's not going to stop bleeding. No. So, I don't know. I've almost been thinking about, uh, you know, those cut-resistant gloves that you use for, like, filleting fish? <laughs> the elf glove? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I think they're, like, Kevlar gloves oh, that are yeah. cut-resistant. But Might not be a bad idea to throw in the pack. Yeah, I mean, the last thing you want to deal with is slicing yourself with one of those knives. Yeah. So, um, anyways, just a side note. But yeah, anyways, so that being a, a white-tailed doe wasn't huge. It was a nice size for a doe. 
But you and I grabbed a leg each and carried this thing down, which wasn't a great distance. Like I said, maybe would it have even been a kilometer that we had to drag it? Yeah, it wasn't very long. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that which was is fine because we didn't have any like wagon or yeah uh, any system really to get it out of there. But that was tiring alone, just two guys carrying out a, a yeah. dough. So it gives you an idea if you know if you haven't done it to be prepared yeah. and and, and I, th- uh, I think what we're going to focus on maybe this year is uh, trying to quarter an animal in the field. Yeah, especially if we're way out there. Yeah, like yeah. the gutless method. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so we took the whole thing out as is. It was gutted, obviously, and uh, got it back to your house. I was getting a little bit concerned about the heat at that point. Yep. We'd shot it very early in the morning, so it was still pretty cool, but the day was warming up, and um, even as we were going out, there was flies starting to roll in, so I was getting paranoid, but we got it to your house fairly quickly there and um, did a poor job of hanging it up in your garage, uh, but it yep. was good enough to to skin it tied it off to the uh steps into my house there yeah exactly in the garage i thought those (laughs) steps were gonna go flying off the foundation it's got a lot of weight for a small deer but um so yeah we were able to skin it that was fairly straightforward and then um started to butcher it and the thing i found interesting was that the muscle groups are all very obvious once you start Mm -hmm. cutting the meat apart and um yeah, as we, we cut a lot of the gristle and stuff off, and we did a really good job of keeping it clean and keeping the hair off the meat and organizing each different cut of meat. And that was really cool to kind of get a feel for all the different cuts of meat. I had uh, found a, a cool photo online that sort of laid out all the different groups of, of cuts and stuff like that. And <clears throat> we got it all bagged up. And I think by the time we were done, it was pretty close to 5 o'clock. So we shot the deer around, it was probably about 9.15 in the morning. And by the time we were done butchering it, it was pretty close to 5 o'clock. So it gives you an idea of the amount of work. And we were obviously maybe slow. Yeah, we were slower than an experienced person (laughs) would have been. Well, first time, yeah. But um, we sort of had this vision of, you know, getting a deer and cooking up the back straps and all that. And by the time... We had finished. I had zero appetite, even though we hadn't um, eaten anything pretty much the whole day. We were so focused. We had a few beers in the garage, but mm-hmm. the smell of the deer wasn't bad or anything like that. But there's something about it. just gets about stuck it. in your... When you spent that much time in front of raw meat and yeah. there was certain scents. There, they weren't bad, but for whatever reason, I had no appetite and you ended up <clears throat> cooking some up after i left and yeah <laughs> my yeah my wife ate it no problem but i was like oh my god i can't eat this yeah spending that much time with it right so, i'm sure i'm sure uh with more experience we'll it would be different to but, it, yeah um yeah every and then i thought oh i'm gonna eat this instead and i'd eat something else and it tasted like that and then i'd eat something else and it tasted like the deer so yeah uh, i kind of thought okay I'm putting the deer in the fridge. I'm going to try it again tomorrow. Try it again the next day, and it tasted awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, the, maybe give it a day. So that was in, was that November? Or was that October? No, I think it was October. October. Yeah. So we're into uh, March already, and not much of that deer is left. We split it up. Yeah, so, it's pretty much gone. Yeah. Um, but man, I've enjoyed eating it so much and, uh, it was a bit of a learning curve. I think I've got it dialed in now, but it cooks so fast. So like the first things that I had cooked up, like the back straps and that, I was pretty surprised by how quickly they cooked. And like the first stuff, I dried it out a bit more than I would have liked to, but I still really enjoyed it. But then I made a few stews out of it and, um, what was the, uh, I can't remember the cup, but the ones that I just came and got from you a couple of weeks ago there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were, um, I think they were both like hind quarter cuts. Yeah, exactly. Cuts, yeah. Um, so like I ended sirloin up, or uh, eye of round, that kind of thing. Yeah. So one of them I just cut up and put into a stew, and that was fantastic. That was the second stew that I made. And the other one I cut into steaks and then marinated overnight and then uh, just 
basically uh, braise those in a Dutch oven and then cook them in the oven for, fuck, I think it was only 10 minutes and they were cooked Mm -hmm. um, perfectly. And then there were so many of them, I could only eat a few steaks that night and then ended up cutting some up and uh, making um, sort of like tacos with them, like with a mango salsa kind of thing. And fuck, that was delicious. And then I... had a bit more left over that I did. I just cooked up for breakfast. I'm like, oh my God, man, it's so fucking good. And I think for some reason people aren't too into deer meat, but it's all about how you cook it and yeah, for and sure. how you prepare it and the time of year that you get it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So You throw it in a stew and you serve it to somebody, I guarantee they won't be able to tell if it's beef or deer. Yeah, so I had told you the first stew that I made and uh, was going to get Ashley's brother to eat it, my brother-in-law, mm. and he wouldn't touch it. He's like, oh, venison, that's, I don't want any of that shit. Mm-hmm. And then so the second one I made a few months later, I didn't tell him what it was, and <laughs> he loved it. <laughs> so you know now? He knows now, yeah. After oh, okay. he ate it, like, so, oh, what's that? He's like, oh, it was really good. Like, yeah, that was deer you just ate. He's like, hmm, well, I guess I eat deer now. I'm like, yeah. Mm. And uh, he had some of the tacos too, so right. he's hooked on it. So... um like you said, we're in March, and uh, one of the things we've been talking about is bear. Yeah, we've been going back so, and forth on this thing for quite a while. So that'll be um, uh, maybe another podcast. I think so, yeah. But uh, yeah, looking forward to getting back out there. Definitely. Yeah, and that's a way to get out in uh, early season. So uh, yeah, we'll talk more about it because I've been doing a ton of reading, and I think you have too. We've gone back and forth on whether or not we're interested or not. Mm-hmm. So, cuz at the end of the day for us it's a large part about the meat. Yeah. Um so if we don't feel like we want to eat something then we're probably not going to go hunting for it. But yeah. I think we've heard conflicting reports some people saying that it's um you don't want to go anywhere near it and other people saying that they yeah we t- we were told that but it's actually turned into our favorite meal. So I think we got to figure it out for ourselves yeah yeah i'm in i think but we'll talk more about it um i think on the next episode we can maybe talk about some of the gear that we've collected over the last two seasons because gear is obviously very important yeah it's one of my favorite parts (laughs) yeah (laughs) kelly's uh, a bit of a geek when it comes to (laughs) gear and specs and he's excellent uh source of knowledge when whenever you're looking into equipment so we'll talk a bit about that And do you want to talk about some of the calls and stuff next week? For sure. If we got time. So there's lots of different, uh, there's a wolf call and um, deer calls. And the wolf call is kind of the big one that people are upset about right now. So I don't know if Kelly and I have the same opinion on it. So we'll talk more about that next week. Um, We have an email address, Cal. It's the rookie hunter podcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, all that good shit. Um, Thanks for for listening. If you made it this far, you obviously dug what we were doing. So thanks for hanging out. Um, We didn't mention that Kelly and I love beer. So we're going to be trying a different brew on each one. And today I picked up a Red Truck Ale. This is brewed in uh, Vancouver, BC. So it's a nice BC brewski. Dig it. Yeah, digging it. Pretty good. We knocked down two of them during this, so obviously they were enjoyed. Mm -hmm. But anyways, thanks a lot for listening. We'll uh, see you in a week here. Cheers. Happy hunting. Till next time.